I like TED Talks because they're often about a really good idea that somebody had. I'm not going to do that today. My name is Todd Ehlers. I'm a professor of geosciences at the University of Glasgow. Today, I'm going to give you an anti-TED Talk. I'm going to talk about the worst idea ever. I want you to think for a minute. What was the worst idea you ever had? Hmm. Well, perhaps it related to a bad financial decision you made, or perhaps it was a decision that you made in a relationship that you regret. Well, if we're going to answer the question of what makes a really bad idea, we might want to think about, did it cause pain and suffering of others? Or did it have a long-lasting and very negative impact? Alternatively, maybe it was really expensive. Okay, you all probably have an idea now in your head of your worst idea ever, but I want us to supersize our thinking now and think about what was humanity's worst idea? Whoa, that's tough. Perhaps it was the invention of gunpowder. Or some people might say it was the invention of capitalism. Alternatively, maybe it was the invention of disco music. <laughs> the disco music era was accompanied by really bad music, except for the Bee Gees, very outrageous dance moves like I just demonstrated, and extremely suspicious choices in fashion. Hmm. Okay, let's be more serious, though. Let's think deeper. What was humanity's worst idea ever? Well, perhaps it was the invention and proliferation of nuclear weapons that for the first time in human history allowed us to destroy all of humanity in a few minutes. Like many of you, I grew up in the Cold War era. I remember as a child reading an article in our local newspaper that showed a map of our city, and it showed what would happen if a one megaton nuclear weapon hit our city. I carefully located where our house was and realized that I would be vaporized, our house would be flattened, and everything I cared about in life would be destroyed with only a 10-minute warning. That's a difficult situation to grow up in. However, some people might argue that there were good aspects to this, to the Cold War. For example, nuclear weapons provided a quicker end to World War II, and they've provided us with decades of deterrence against large-scale conventional warfare. So perhaps they weren't the worst idea ever. We need to think more. What could be worse? The idea I want to communicate in this talk is that the worst idea ever was humanity's decision to commence with the mass burning of fossil fuels, things like oil, gas, and coal. We started doing this around the year 1850 to facilitate the Industrial Revolution. And we're still continuing to do it today at an even greater and greater rate. This photograph comes from 1860 and is, one of the ex is an example of one of the first large-scale oil fields that humans developed to facilitate this industrial revolution. This is when we started our experiment on, on nature of what mass emissions of greenhouse gases can do. Of course, to be fair, you could also argue that a lot of good things come from burning fossil fuels and from the Industrial Revolution. We live in a far better world today than, than people did before the Industrial Revolution. We've decreased poverty. We have cures for diseases. Our lives are surrounded with amazing things, like disco music. However, what I'm going to show you today is that all the benefits we've gained from the burning of fossil fuels and the Industrial Revolution are now being undone. It all starts here. This figure shows 
humans' carbon dioxide emissions since the Industrial Revolution. What you see for the first hundred years or so is that our emissions of carbon dioxide were relatively low. They increase ever so slightly. And then around the year 1950, they start to increase rapidly, and this is often referred to as the Great Acceleration. The numbers you see there are gigatons of carbon dioxide per year that are emitted. Gigaton is a billion tons. And today we are close to 38 billion tons of CO2 that are emitted per year into our atmosphere. 38 billion. Now that is a really hard number to comprehend. 38 billion. So to help put it in perspective, let's think about a small compact car like a Fiat 500 here. These have a mass of about one ton. So every year we are emitting, in, the, in terms of carbon dioxide, the equivalent mass of 38 billion Fiat 500s. That works out to about five cars per person on average around the globe. That's a lot of fiats, okay? So, why was this the worst idea? Well, as many of you know, carbon dioxide, along with some other gases, is a greenhouse gas. They function to help trap more and more of the sun's energy in our atmosphere, leading to the warming of it. So what have these emissions done? What has this warming done? Do we know how much it is? Well, for centuries, scientists have been measuring how the, how the near-surface temperatures have increased. And that's what you see here. Starting around the Industrial Revolution and for the first hundred years, we see lots of wiggles here. These are basically showing us with the numbers there that this is, we're bouncing around what the uh, warming temperatures were around the time of the pre-Industrial Revolution. Okay, then starting around 1950, we see this rapid increase again, the great acceleration in temperatures. Okay, and today we are sitting at around one and a half degrees warmer than we were in pre-industrial times. Okay, okay, hold on here. A very fair question to ask is, couldn't nature do this on its own? Hmm, well, the short answer is no. So there are two reasons why. The first is geologists have reconstructed climate over Earth history. And what we can say with confidence is that the warming that you see shown in this graph has not been observed on Earth for the last 100,000 years. 100,000 years. This is truly exceptional. The second thing is that scientists from around the world have independently investigated and run climate models to evaluate what nature would normally do without our greenhouse gas emissions. That's the blue line here. What you see is that throughout, since the pre-industrial revolution, we would just have these wiggles and this natural variability that comes from things like carbon dioxide emitted from volcanoes and other natural processes that are going on there. So if we compare these two curves, the difference between the yellow and the blue line that you see there, and particularly over the last 70 years, this is due to humans. That is now widely accepted. And if you're still not convinced, we can overlay the previous plot I showed you of our emissions through time, and there's a rather shocking agreement here between the emissions that we've been putting out and how the temperatures have raised. Eh, hold on a second. Who cares? Is warming necessarily bad? If you live in Scotland, like I do, or here in Stockholm, it, we could handle it being a little bit warmer, right? However, we're continually bombarded in the news by the effects of global warming. And this relates to various extreme events we see all of these types of things have been predicted by scientists for the last 30 years as a consequence of global warming. For example, with global warming, you have increased heat waves that occur. Over the last 20 years, this has resulted in 61,000 deaths at a minimum. And in Europe, this year alone, it's over 1,500 from the heat wave that hit us. Global warming and these heat waves, along with changes in how precipitation is distributed, 
within a year, lead to more wildfires, like we saw at the beginning of this year in Los Angeles and now over this summer across Europe. Increased global warming increases the probability that you will have droughts, as we have now in Africa and emerging even more and more across the Mediterranean region, Central Asia, and almost every other continent. Increased global warming influences how precipitation is distributed. You get more intense storms and longer dry periods in between. This is why we see increased flooding in the news regularly. Warming of the atmosphere from global warming and also warming of the ocean is leading to more intense hurricanes and quite possibly an increased frequency with which they occur. And lastly, a warmer atmosphere and a warmer ocean means that the ocean can become more acidic. This acidity and the rate at which it is increasing is challenging the marine biosphere. It cannot evolve fast enough and is an environmental catastrophe there as well. Now, if you think through these different examples and how they impact the environment, and then also think through all the uh, social consequences of these types of events, that in itself should be enough for you to agree with me that this is the worst idea we've ever had. However, there's a new field of study coming out where people are looking even more intensely at what we call climate change economics and looking at the effects of global warming. And the reality that we have now is that global warming is really expensive. So here's an example of one recent study. The study showed that the world economy would be $28 trillion richer if it weren't for the th last 30 years of greenhouse gas emissions by 111 major oil companies or energy companies, 28 trillion. Now this number just reflects the damages due to extreme heat events. It doesn't account for things like drought or the effects of sea level rise and the costs of that, 28 trillion. The problem is we don't really feel this because it's distributed and the bill comes very indirectly to us, but we're paying for this. Now, this study was done over the last 30 years. Very fair question is, what's going to happen in the future? What will the cost be for our children or grandchildren? Well, economists have started to look at this as well. If we have 1.5 degrees of warming over the next decades, which we most likely will, the global gross domestic product will decrease by 3.2%. If we have three degrees of warming, which is close to what we're expecting to see by the year 2100 now, global gross domestic product will decrease by, uh, by 10%. 10%. And unfortunately, developing countries, poorer countries, will be hit harder with a 17% decrease. Now, 10% gross domestic product decline, that's a hard number to comprehend. How much money actually is that? Well, to put it into context, the global, global economic costs of the COVID-19 pandemic in just the year 2000, 2022 alone was half this. The global financial crisis in 2009 cost one-fifth of this. So this is a significant amount. Now, I should also emphasize a couple things. These numbers are very conservative. More recent work coming out suggests that it might be even five times higher than that. And please keep in mind, this is analyzing the effect of events. It's not able to look at, or we're not able yet, to look at longer-term effects such as drought or sea level rise. The costs will be astronomical. To summarize, then, Fossil fuels burned since the Industrial Revolution. They've made us all richer, but before long, they're going to be making us poorer and much poorer. So when we think about all this, are there solutions? Can we have hope? It's hard to. But I believe we can, and here's why. In 2013, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicted that by the year 2100, we would be living in a world that is four degrees warmer. 
four degrees. That's a scary number. This would be a catastrophe for natural systems. It could possibly lead to collapse of civilizations. However, since then, a lot of things have changed. We've had the Paris Agreement, where a number of countries have agreed to try and cap this warming at 1.5 degrees. We're also going through a green transition now, where we're having new technologies that can help wean us off of the use of fossil fuels. Progress has been made. We're also talking about global warming more than we ever did before, and governments are thinking about this and working on it also. The most current estimate, though, is that by the year 2100, the warming will be about 2.7 degrees Celsius. This is still a really scary number, and we are going to see some serious implications in the environment and in society from this amount of warming, but it's a whole lot better than four degrees. So we do have hope for the future of our children and grandchildren. It's going to be a different world for them, but there is hope. Progress is being made. The important thing here is that we're aware of this problem and we're trying to make, implement changes. We're trying to think about ways to decrease these carbon emissions here. We also have these technological advances like massive reduction in the cost of solar panels and increased accessibility for people to use them. However, Please remember the emissions curve through time I showed you, and that year after year, our carbon dioxide emissions continue to grow. We have to change this radically in the next five years, or it's predicted that we will cross major tipping points in environmental systems that will be hard to recover from. So we need to stay vigilant. And as individuals, the important thing is that we continue to be vigilant and thinking about the transportation we use to get to work, the transportation we use on our holidays, the food we eat and what the carbon sources and carbon requirements are to produce that, how we heat our homes and businesses, how we construct them. All of these things matter. Together, if we can continue to do this, I believe we can fix the worst idea ever. Thank you.